Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society. And today I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Pickle, who is going to be talking to us about hormone therapy, not only in transgender women, but the aging transgender woman. She's a board certified family medicine physician. She's fellowship trained in women's health and a transgender medicine specialist. She's an associate professor in family and community medicine at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, you know, when we talk about the transgender woman, I guess, firstly, it's going to depend on when they enter their journey and where they are on their journey. So speak to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, people kind of come to the recognition that gender affirming hormones need to be part of their gender journey at various stages in their life. Um, we know that probably three out of four transgender women will utilize gender affirming hormones at some point in their gender journey. Um, there may be very valid reasons why somebody chooses to have hormone therapy as part of their journey and why others may not. Um, but it really does kind of depend on those other coexisting health conditions that somebody might have that might allow them to start gender affirming hormones um, earlier or later in life, sometimes access to care as well, um, finding a clinician that can provide care and, and kind of be in this process mm -hmm. with you can also be hard. So there can be so many factors that go into play as to why folks start gender affirming hormone therapy or where in their journey they start. So let's focus a little bit on where in the journey. So, you know, mm -hmm. for um, a woman who is transgendered and now in midlife and beyond, we often talk about those windows of benefit, windows of risk of, you know, gender affirming hormones in all people. So right. how, you know, how do we weigh sort of as, as a patient who's coming to see you, how is it weighed in terms of the benefit versus the risk uh, I would assume now in continuing gender affirming yeah, hormone therapy, yeah. but now you're approaching midlife and, you know, what we midlife and beyond, as we say. Yeah. So, you know, whether somebody is getting ready to initiate gender affirming hormones in midlife and beyond. So let's say in somebody's forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, whether they're initiating hormone therapy or continuing hormone therapy, there's going to be some basic things that folks are going to want to talk with their clinician about. If they're getting ready to initiate hormone therapy, we want to have a really honest discussion about the limitations of hormone therapy. For instance, estrogen based hormone therapy does not really help hair regrow. So if there's already been some hair loss that has occurred because of the effects of testosterone over the years, estrogen can put a pause on that um, hair loss, but it doesn't um, cause hair to regrow. Estrogen okay. also doesn't change vocal pitch or frequency. So somebody may need to pursue gender affirming voice therapy if they want the vocal quality of their voice to change. So there's some really honest discussions that can happen in the office about what do gender affirming hormones physiologically and on the body, what kind of changes do they cause? And then over what time frames? You know, we always say puberty doesn't happen overnight. Gender journeys also don't happen overnight. These are physical changes in process that happen over the years. And as things happen over the years, health conditions can change. So having that established relationship with a clinician where if new health conditions pop up that may change new medications and those medications may require your hormone therapy to be adjusted. Those are the kind of longitudinal conversations you want to be able to have. You also want to share past medical history. If you've had surgeries, if you have underlying or other medical conditions, um, mental health experiences can be really important for your clinician to understand. And then your family history. So how do genetics play a contributing role to your health story? And again, we can take all of those things into consideration when we are starting a gender um, hormone journey with someone. But there is not an absolute age where somebody couldn't start their journey. And I have lots of folks tell me in their 50s and 60s, I didn't even know this was an option for me. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have started this journey when I was a teen or when I was in my 20s or 30s, but we just didn't have access to this care then. And now I do. What are my options? I um, mean, in the majority of patients, the studies show that the potential benefits of hormone therapy likely outweigh the risk as long as we're being thoughtful about those other things that could contribute to risk. 
But let's talk about risk. So, you know, yeah. um, as a transgendered person getting older, looking at estrogen and the inevitable thought about the relationship between breast cancer, for example, which is a universal concern. Right. Yeah. So, you know, anytime somebody has uh, breasts and people are aging, we think about breast cancer. And certainly we think about breast cancer in transgender women and trans feminine folks and really any individuals who are using estrogen in their hormone therapy. Um, we know typically after five years of estrogen use and when somebody turns anywhere from 40 to age 45, that's when we're going to start to think about breast cancer screening. We know breast cancer risk is higher in trans women than it is in cisgender men, but it's lower than in cisgender women. And so we do want to think about breast cancer screening, but we know that risk is lower than cisgender women. We can think about mammograms and ultrasounds and MRIs, and it really depends on that individual, their breast density, what if they're having any breast complaints, we might choose a different, um, a different process of diagnosing a breast concern. And we also think about family history and how genetics might play a role. And the last question before I let you go is that notion of a mandatory stop date. So, you know, years ago and not all that many years ago, there was that notion, you know, the shortest period for the shortest length of time and the shortest dose and all that all sort of fueling the concern that estrogen equals breast cancer. So in this particular situation, is there a mandatory stop date? There's not. Um, the current data that we have support allowing individuals to stay on their gender affirming hormone therapy um, for as long as it makes sense to them. Again, every medication, every intervention we do in medicine has possible benefit and possible risk. And these are really those shared decision making between patients and their clinicians where you look at the whole picture. So there's not a mandatory start date or a maximum time that somebody would have to start. And there certainly is not a maximum time that somebody would need to stop. And really those are those conversations that we're having in the offices, kind of taking that whole person approach to care. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and really shedding some light on a topic that we often don't talk about and should. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro.